Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Seneca's letter number 23 is a fairly short one, but there's a lot that's packed in there. And it's a very important one because in it we've got this great Stoic philosopher highlighting to his interlocutor the absolute importance and the possibility for us of having a life that is filled with a positive emotional state with joy. And the joy here is talked about in several ways. It's, it's a verb gaudere, to feel joy, to have joy in your life, and also uh, gladness, laetitia, right? There's like a set of synonyms that connect with each other in this. And Seneca is telling Lucilius, this is available for you. He's not saying, only the wise person ever enjoys this positive emotional state. Rather, anybody who sets their life up in the right way and then follows through on that can experience this. And so he tells his, his friend, do you think I'm going to write about how the winter has treated us and uh, the, the spring and all the other nonsense people write when they're short of things to say? No, I'll write something that will benefit both you and me. And we should pause on that for a moment. Why would it be beneficial Seneca giving advice like this to his correspondent, Lucilius? Well, because they're in a relationship. And you could say, although Seneca is not saying that right here, that we also can take joy in the joy of others. So he goes on and he says, what will that thing be? What else but to exhort you, to urge you towards excellence of mind, ad bonum mentum, to having a good mind, a mind in good condition. And then he says, uh, would you like to know what such excellence is founded upon? What is the basis, the fundamentum for this? And he's going to take that word back in just a moment. What is it? Don't rejoice in empty things. Ne gaudias vanis. So empty things or vain things. Well, this is an idea that's kicked around by a lot of ancient schools. There's a, there's a number of things that won't really make us happy, but people will tell us and culture will tell us and the examples of watching other people compete for these will tell us that these things could in fact make us feel joy. And it's up to us what we try to find joy in. So he's, he's writing to somebody and saying, don't try to find your joy in these empty or vain things. Why is that going to be a problem? He goes on and he says, did I say it was the foundation? The pinnacle rather. So instead of being the basis on the bottom, it's at the top. Uh, reaching the heights means knowing what to rejoice in, finding prosperity or one's happiness in what nobody else can control, what nobody else has power over in aliana potestate. So, you know, if somebody has control over a item that I think I need for my joy, well, that person has power over me. And it's not just Epictetus later who's writing or saying these things, uh, Arian is recording them, but Seneca is as well, right? Because this is a common Stoic idea. So he tells us that what we want to do is avoid hope, space, 
And the Stoics had a very negative attitudes toward um, this particular affective disposition, hoping for things that we have no idea about, that it fall in somebody else's power. Why? Because that leaves us anxious, solicitous, and uncertain in certus. So if I have to hope that my health is going to hold out or hope that somebody who I'm attracted to will be attracted to me or hope that I'll get a good promotion at work or we could go on and on and on, that I'll win the lottery. That's really putting a lot of eggs into the wrong basket, uh, you could say. And so he tells Lachilius that even if hope is for something close at hand or not difficult to get, even if the things one hoped for never proved disappointing, you're, you're taking a risk here. So what can you do instead? He says, Lucilius, learn how to experience joy. Disca, learn. Gaudere, how to have joy. And then he's going to, a little bit later, talk about this as real, verum, joy, or true joy. So not just any joy. Don't just say, oh, well, you know, what makes me happy? Chewing bubble gum. I'm going to go to the store and get me some bubble gum, and then I'll chew it, and I'll blow some bubbles, then I'll be happy. I mean, that's a great example because if you've ever had bubble gum, you know that the flavor disappears right away, right? And that you're left with this, this substance within your mouth. And yes, you can blow bubbles in it. If I were to do that, of course, the bubbles would get caught in my beard, and that would probably not be a lot of fun for me. <laughs> We also sometimes get gum stuck in our hair when we are kids as well. And we could multiply examples of these sorts of things. So he, he says, um, you know, I'm not telling you to avoid anything that will actually make you happy. But what I want is that gladness should never be absent from you. And then he's got this wonderful expression. I want it to be born in your own home. And that is what will happen if it comes to be inside of you. Other delights do not fill the heart. They're trivial feelings that merely smooth the brow. Don't think every person who smiles is rejoicing. Instead, what do we have to do? We have to look to the kind of mind, again, the good mind, the excellence of mind that a person will have. The mind must be energetic, a locker, you know, ready to take on challenges, confident, Fidens, uh, you know, faithful, you could even say, having faith in things. Now, we should contrast that to the, to the hope here, right? Hope is for what's out of our control. We can be confident from the Stoic perspective about what actually is in our own power or control. And then he says, upright and superior to all things, super omnia erectus, raised, standing, above all these other matters. Superior to every trial could work for that. And then he says that, what is this going to involve? Despising death, opening your home to poverty, reigning in pleasure, rehearsing the endurance of pain. And he says, one who's pondering such things is experiencing a great joy, but hardly a soft or seductive one. This is the joy I want you to possess. Why? Because it will never run out. You will never run out of it once you know where to find it. And he's got this metaphor about mines, right? When you have a mine, let's say it's a gold mine, you're like, wow, look at this, I'm going to be rich, right? Or you can think about oil in our own time. You're digging in your backyard, and boom, up comes some, some oil, you know, like in the Beverly Hillbillies, and oh, I'm going to have a ton of money now. Well, you don't know how deep those reserves go right? They can run out very quickly. And if they're merely surface matters, well, then you're in a little bit of pr trouble, right? He says that the most precious loads are hidden deep in the earth, and it is these that will repay the effort of digging with greater abundance. Where are you going to dig? In yourself. You're going to transform the person you are. And he says, you know, you're going to have to make some choices. And he says there's one course of action, one thing, literally, unum, that can make you happy. And so what is that? Well, you have to focus on what is actually yours. Well, what is yours? I mean, you've got all sorts of things that you 
think of as yours, right? For example, I'm wearing this outfit right now. It is my tie. It is my shirt. I'm recording this with my uh, equipment. You're hearing it on whatever your devices are that you're using. But what do we really have? Our own self. Te ipso, your very self, who you are, as he calls it, the best part of what you think of as you. So what does this mean? We have to not necessarily throw out everything that's externals or say, I can't have any pleasure in those at all, but it's not going to be in external things in say our property or our position or our social status or things like that. And then he says, well, what about our bodies? And he says, well, our bodies, they're necessary, but they're not great. They're not wonderful. I mean, we actually have a certain risk that comes up because of our bodies. He says that the pleasures it accumulates are empty, short, and regrettable. Besides, unless tempered with a good deal of self-control, they turn into pleasures opposite. Just prime example of this, people who drink too much, right? Drink alcohol, and then they wind up with a hangover in the morning, right? They're like, ah, that feels good to get drunk. I mean, it, it, it sure does at first, and then when you're, as we say, praying to the porcelain God or experience the headache the next day, it doesn't feel quite so good. And the pleasure was rather fleeting. So put aside external things, put aside things that are merely that of the body. And then he says, it's okay to be greedy. A certain kind of greed, aviditas. Greed for what is genuinely good will be satisfied. It will be satisfied if you do something that's particularly important. And he says, where does this uh, satisfaction come from? A good conscience, honorable counsels, right action, despising the things of fortune, and a calm and steady mode of life that walks a single road. And here's where we get to something absolutely central to this. As Seneca is going to tell Lucilius, most people don't make deliberate arrangements. Concilio, a concilio is a plan, an intention, uh, disponant, disposing, setting out, right? They don't do this uh, for their, their life or we could say for themselves and their possessions. And the expression that he uses there is say yourself, suaque, those things that are yours. So our, our possessions, our body, and also our very own self, most people don't make a plan. Or they do, you know, around New Year's, they're like, ooh, New Year, new me, I'm gonna make these resolutions, but they don't stick to them. Or they do it only for things like, oh, I'm going on a diet, that's your body. Oh, I'm gonna like have a budget. Well, that's your externals. What are you gonna do for you, the person that is at the core of all of these possessions and at your, you know, the core of what your body, this changing thing is. What are you gonna do about that? And Seneca says, this is where a lot of people go wrong and they prevent themselves from experiencing true joy. They're like objects floating in a river. They're just moving with the current, right? He uses some others. They jump around from one plan to another. They're blown about by every breeze of chance, and this is not going to work. And then he brings up Epicurus and he says, uh, this is a great line. It's wearisome to always be beginning one's life. And he says, we can rephrase this as they live badly who are always starting to live. And who is this? The people who haven't figured out a plan for themselves and they're constantly either making a new plan or just letting something else make the plan for them. They don't have any continuity. They haven't banked any time as we might say. But if you do that, if you follow the opposite course, you make a deliberate plan for yourself and you actually stick to it, well then you are placing yourself on the road to experiencing true joy and you're never going to run out of it, Seneca says, because it's coming from within you, not from all these other things that you're hoping are going to make you happy that actually turn out to be 
empty or vain. Instead, learn how to experience and produce true joy for yourself, through yourself, in yourself.